questions. How could this apply to space? How could it apply to NASA? How could it apply to space exploration? And what are the tweaks or, permuta or permutations that we could do on that um, that would engage uh, the younger demographic in, in what NASA is doing? I think it's absolutely critical that we need to, we need to reach out in different ways uh, to that demographic if we are to continue this, this great exploration that we're embarking on. So, Jerry, if it's all right, uh, I, I think I'll turn it over to you, and uh, you can do a much better job of telling us all about that and, and also introducing the folks on your panel. Thanks, George. Can you bring up the first video, please? Okay. While we're doing that, I'll introduce my panel. Um, my name is Jerry Hennigan. I'm the CEO of Virtual Heroes Incorporated, based out of Cary, North Carolina. Uh, we're a small engineering and game development uh, team that focuses on serious games, and we'll define what serious games are a little bit later. I'm also joined by Dr. Michael Zaida from the University of Southern California. Uh, Michael Zaida was one of the founding fathers of the America's Army Game Project, and that's where I came to know him. He also teaches the uh, game development and game design curriculum uh, at the undergraduate and graduate level at USC. Uh, he will speak about that. And then we've also got uh, Dr. Daniel Laughlin, who's here from uh, Goddard Space Center. And he's one of the leading thinkers in terms of leveraging game technology for space exploration and NASA's purposes. So hopefully we'll give you a little flavor about what's going on in the game industry, why it's relevant to space exploration, and how this might be important for you. Go ahead and roll tape. We close tonight with the latest thing, a successful thing, from the Pentagon. It's not a new supersonic jet or satellite-guided smart bomb. It's a computer game offering potential recruits a taste of virtual warfare. A 21st century version of that famous poster of Uncle Sam saying, I want you for the U.S. Army. As Jim Acosta reports for Eye on America. These soldiers are real. All clear! But they're also actors. Staging scenes for the Army's latest war game. It's a video game created by the U.S. Army to win over the hearts and minds of American teenagers. And judging by these faces, mission accomplished. You think this is going to work on a lot of guys your age? Uh, definitely. Definitely. Because it's a fun game. The game, America's Army, has become such an overnight hit... And welcome to the M16 qualification ring. The Army staged a tournament in New York. Recruiters were waiting at the door. So this is a recruiting opportunity. Exactly, it's a fantastic recruiting opportunity. I uh, would like to sign up as many as possible. We're looking for more in nature of five to 10. Yeah, one warning. One of these teens enlisted after playing the game. The other two are thinking about it, which is exactly what the game's creator had in mind. We look at all the things that the Army's doing that are under the control of the Army that capture people's attention, and the game is number one. America's Army has even surpassed the Pentagon's expectations. It's now the number one online action game in the country. The Army hasn't seen a recruiting tool this effective since Be All You Can Be. War is not a game. Go, 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 go! But psychology professor Brad Bushman, a critic of violent video games, complains America's Army isn't real enough. The video game does provide a sanitized view of violence. For example, when you shoot someone or when you are shot, you see a puff of blood. Uh, you don't see anybody suffering or writhing in pain. The game's creator disagrees. Kids aren't stupid. They know if they come in the army, there's a reason we have rifles and tanks and all that stuff. The players insist they understand the meaning of game over. If you're gonna join the army, you know the risks. I mean, in this game, you might die like eight times in like 15 minutes. So in real life, you know, People know what they're getting into. New editions of America's Army are now being developed for home video game systems. A move that will deploy even more young cyber soldiers to the military's virtual battlefield. In West Point, New York, I'm Jim Acosta for Eye on America. Virtual war, part of our rapidly changing world tonight. For the CBS Evening News, Dan Rather reporting. Good night. Please bring up the first PowerPoint. Thank you. 
So I think what that brief clip shows you is how the Army is using games as a medium, like films and magazines and other uh, newspapers, things like that, television ads, to reach out. That game was conceived of uh, back in 1999, uh, way before 9-11. It was uh, designed to show young people the career opportunities available in the Army. And so as the situation has developed in the Middle East, it, it's taken on different uh, parameters. Um, so this is us. Um, Where's my controller? Okay, thank you, I got it, all right. Uh, I can be trained. Um, so this is just a mock-up that our company did of a uh, lunar base uh, using the Unreal Engine. Uh, this is my bio, I'm a West Point graduate. I was an Apache helicopter pilot for 13 years in the Army. I did the MBA at Duke University. I worked for Tom Clancy when I exited the Army. Uh, it was one of my first jobs. It was very exciting until the company was sold to a publisher. I uh, worked at the Research Triangle Institute developing medical technologies using uh, uh, game uh, tech and uh, also worked on America's Army for about the last three years. Uh, Michael Zida will be up here shortly, but these are some of his interests and his background. and Daniel Laughlin. Daniel has a very unique perspective, having been a visioneer for NASA's use of, uh, potential use of games. So it would be appropriate to talk about the size of the game industry, why this is relevant. Um, the game industry is bigger than the film industry uh, in the U.S. and abroad. In the U.S., it's a $7.3 billion a year industry. Worldwide, it's $35 billion a year and it's expected to grow exponentially over the next several years. Uh, just to give you an idea of that, it, the, the industry is almost as big as the U.S. Navy in terms of the dollars spent and the people involved in it. Uh, 228 million games sold last year. It's like two for every household. And uh, what's an interesting stat is that the average age is 30 years and growing. And so we call it the thin edge of the wedge as folks uh, age 37 and younger are getting positions of responsibility in the workforce. They're making decisions in terms of uh, using games for training, uh, educating their folks, and uh, other purposes. These stats come from the Entertainment uh, Standards uh, Board, the uh, ESA. Uh, you can look these up on the web, uh, pretty interesting statistics. Um, interestingly enough, uh, young boys age 6 to 17 are uh, outweighed by in terms of women playing games that are over 18 so a lot of young ladies are playing games and uh, it's almost an equal split in terms of the demographics uh, one of the things that you'll see is when you look uh, these are PC games uh, as opposed to games played on platforms like Xboxes and PlayStations and PlayStation portables um, a lot of these games involve um, shooting uh, you saw that with America's Army. There are certain ethical and moral questions that that begs in terms of the content that our children are being exposed to. Um, I say that as a, not only a West Point grad and a former Army officer, but also as a parent. Uh, the Entertainment Standards Rating Board has a very rigid uh, standards uh, th that's applied to games in terms of a rating system. It's very much like the movie industry. So in terms of media literacy, I think parents have to make good choices for their kids and uh, kids shouldn't be exposed to inappropriate material. But you'll see that um, uh, when you look at shooters and action, that's normally the same thing. That's uh, a big chunk of what kids are, are involved with. Um, these are games on consoles like Xboxes and uh, Playstations. You'll see the same type of thing, 30.1% action, and then you've got shooters down there. So why are we here speaking to you today? We think that the technology is ready and the market is ready to have something that's uh, new and wholesome and based on real science to inspire and educate the youth, uh, also our workforce, uh, for the future of space exploration. Um, obviously, government agencies are facing budgetary challenges in a time of war when the DOD spending is growing exponentially. That's the bad news. The good news is that that knowledge that's been gleaned from creating these types of applications for the military can be used, can be privatized for purposes of uh, entrepreneurs and government initiatives and space exploration. Um, games can help make space exploration relevant to the public. Uh, kids will play these games, their parents will play these games with them, and it will make the whole wonder and excitement that we've been experiencing here over the last couple of days real for folks. 
And then, of course, the commercial uh, entities can use these types of games, once again, as a medium for advert gaming, messaging, public relations, and outreach. Uh, an example, just to go back to the Army game, because that's what we're familiar with, um, it started off as a public outreach uh, tool, and it's actually used for three things. Uh, we were contracted several years ago to make it into a platform. Uh, it's got three objectives, and these objectives actually map pretty nicely with perhaps what NASA or commercial space operator would want. Um, strategic communications, uh, training and education, and mission planning and rehearsal. Uh, we use the game to train people in robotic operations. Uh, we train special forces uh, operators on adaptive thinking and leadership. Uh, we work with uh, Special Operations Command. We work with young soldiers to teach them about the life, uh, ABCs of life saving. In fact, we've had some anecdotal evidence where in the public game, some of the first aid applications that we've had uh, created uh, saved lives because kids learned how to save their siblings when bad things happened. Um, there are two websites that I would draw your attention to, americasarmy.com and info.americasarmy.com talks about all the training applications that we've made from the game. We also support the, uh, the U.S. Secret Service for dignitary protection, and uh, we also do uh, new weapons development and things like that. So right now we're sitting at 7.1 million registered users. We've got 105,000 hours of gameplay that happen every day. Uh, we've got 1.4 billion missions played, and GameSpy says that we're consistently in the top five online action games in the world. So I show you this because this is what's available to kids. Uh, this was a government initiative. Um, similarly, uh, you know, NASA or a commercial space operator could take the initiative and do something uh, based on real science in the genre of space exploration for gamers. Uh, just got a few comments up here about the generation that we're addressing uh, in the Army game, the game that we support, the age is uh, 13 and up because it's got a teen rating. Uh, kids are connected all the time. I've got a teenager at home, he's wired, he's instant messaging, he's text messaging, and this is how our young folks communicate. Um, it's not traditional didactic instruction with textbooks and classroom lectures. Uh, in terms of games, normally what we see from a systems and mechanics perspective, games have six rule factors. And uh, what's interesting is a lot of kids will struggle in school on certain subjects, but they'll get into a game and uh, be able to talk about geopolitical or economic things related to the game because that's what interests them. Uh, games have also been known to be effective with kids. I have a child at home who has learning differences in terms of uh, opening up new ways for that child to learn about things that he ordinarily struggles with. Um, this is actually very interesting in terms of how game players play these very sophisticated uh, games these days in terms of probing environments, developing hypotheses, testing the hypotheses, proving or disproving them, uh, basically beginning again, respinning. And uh, what we see is uh, these games are encouraging uh, innovation, exploration, uh, and competition. What a lot of people ask is, well, shucks, I mean, a lot of the games out there involve uh, shooting and uh, killing things. Uh, our company about a year and a half ago decided that if we were going to make a space exploration game that was viable, we needed to have a hook that was very interesting and compelling for people to want to spend their time doing. And we came up with a concept of first-person exploration and this involves uh, the things that you see there in terms of creating highly immersive environments where the player is pitting themselves and their wits against uh, nature, uh, the harshness of space, being able to manipulate the technology as it's represented virtually, whether it's robotics or spacesuits or spacecraft or those types of things. Um, we thought it would be important for authenticity to make sure that it's based on real science and not science fiction. Uh, and we thought that it would be interesting to let teams compete against each other in team-oriented MacGyver-like scenarios where they're using their brains and solving puzzles, uh, not just running around and shooting things. And uh, lastly, we thought that it would be important uh, for the purposes that we've discussed to create a platform that could have multi-uses, not only for entertainment and education, but also for mission planning and rehearsal and trying new things out if you're a scientist or someone working for the government. 
I mentioned serious games earlier. I think Michael Zida will talk about that briefly, but uh, we introduce uh, learning uh, with serious games, and uh, the word is pedagogy, and what we're doing is imparting learning for government purposes, corporate training, uh, strategic communications, health or public policy. Um, America's Army has been reported to be the most successful government initiative in that area. Um, there's another game called Food Force that was actually paid for by the United Nations, and that game has been very successful as well, teaching people what happens in developing nations in terms of the specific challenges that folks face overseas. Um, we hear the term STEM a lot, and I actually subscribe to the vision of a woman named Priscilla Elfrey who works at Kennedy Space Center, and she's big into the arts, and so we tend to call it in our office STEAM, uh, and so this is kind of a tribute to her. But we see the um, ability using games to get young people excited about uh, science, technology, education, and math education, and Michael will talk about the program that he's got going at USC, which is dramatically turned around enrollment numbers in the computer science department. So we think we have an opportunity. Uh, the time is now uh, to take the initiative. Um, we want to make what we're all experiencing here at this conference real for millions of people because I think on many people it's been lost. Um, it could be, it could lend itself to digital centennial challenges. Uh, players certainly would become uh, part of a multidisciplinary team and learn about different career fields. Uh, it would give young people all over the world a chance to interact with real scientists, men and women, uh, communicate with them, uh, compete against them, uh, learn about what they do, whether they're a roboticist or a botanist or a geologist or an astrophysicist. Um, this is where young people spend their time and providing wholesome content to them as a way to reach out and educate them. One of the things that's lost on folks is the extreme high fidelity of physics that are now showing up in games. Uh, we use the Unreal Engine in our company, which is one of the most sophisticated engines uh, in the world, if not the most sophisticated. And uh, we use the uh, AGEA physics uh, algorithms. Uh, there are also going to be new physics cards coming out that uh, you know, your kids and your siblings and whatnot want to put in their computers. And uh, these are like what graphics processors used to be. It's just another card you need to buy for your computer to get the highest level of fidelity. Um, and we're going to see more of that. The Electronic Entertainment Expo is out here in Los Angeles next week. And this is the big news in terms of uh, physics processors being shipped with computers now. Um, the other thing I should mention is um, networking. Um, currently, America's Army supports up to 32 people on the Unreal Engine um, at any time. 40% of the gameplay is played outside the United States. Uh, my personal feeling is that if kids uh, in the United States are playing and competing and communicating with other folks all over the world, that's not a bad thing if they're sharing experiences and getting to know them. Uh, especially if it's through the use of wholesome uh, content. Uh, one of the things that will have to be addressed is the specific business model. Um, one of the things that's worked for government and the game industry in the past is the uh, UARC, the uh, University Affiliated Research Consortium. But uh, there are cultural differences. Uh, I've worked at research institutes and game companies, and sometimes it's hard to have you know, government employees talking with game developers and scientists. It's a kind of a, a unique challenge, but uh, we find a way to make it work. Um, I think the uh, fourth bullet up there is really important. We want to reach out to both sexes. This isn't a male-dominated endeavor. Um, uh, we're actually involved in a project right now with the Kaufman Foundation to make science education real for boys and girls 11 to 14 years old, uh, which is a specific uh, challenge that we've undertaken. Um, and then we think it's really exciting w when you're using robotics and vehicles and technology and drilling rigs and things like that to make those authentic as possible uh, to get young people excited about this. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Bring up the second one. Did I put my slides up? Start with the last name Zyda, Z-Y-D-A, on the memory stick. Oh, perfect, thank you. 
Okay, which is the slide button? This one here? Okay, great. I will uh, start out. And uh, hi, I'm Mike Zida, and uh, happy to be here. Uh, this is about 12 minutes, 15 minutes away from my uh, weekday home and about an hour flight from my weekend home. So happy to be here. Anyway, I'm going to start out a little bit. Um, Jerry gave you some of my background, but maybe a little bit more detail is of value to you. The, uh, I'm at USC, the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. I'm the director of the USC Game Pipe Laboratory. When I started in January of 2005, I am also staff at USC Information Sciences Institute, and I am a professor of engineering practice in the Department of Computer Science at USC. And I, previous to that, I was at a school in Monterey, California, called the Naval Postgraduate School. And I think I was there 21 years almost, about a month short of that. I was professor of computer science. I directed the NPSNet Research Group. I founded the Moves Institute. Um, I helped, I wrote the original research plan and operating plan for USC Institute for Creative Technologies while I was at NPS. And I started in computer graphics in 1973, which seems like a long time ago to most of you right now. And uh, one of the early pioneers in the VR field and modeling and simulation in serious games. So. Uh, other background, I just put this up there. I, I've served on the National Research Council Committee since 1992, and I've served on all of those different boards over there, including the Aeronautics and Space Engineering Board, and I'm a permanent national associate of the National Academy. It's probably important from, uh, for you to know where, the, where I'm speaking from. Uh, we built America's Army inside of the Naval Postgraduate School. We started in uh, fall of 1999. It was interesting because I started the project right after I finished uh, writing the research plan and setting up uh, ICT at USC. And uh, the goal was to build this game in support of recruiting. And uh, what we ended up doing was basically building a huge successful video game and operating the game from inside the Naval Postgraduate School. I, I built a full game development team inside of the school, inside of the Moves Institute. In fact, for, for those of you who are into trivia, I founded the Moves Institute and directed the America's Army Game Project at the same time. Moves grew to 70 faculty and staff and about 19 million a year in research funding. And we took it from conception to 3 million registered players. It was an incredible, huge success. It really is the game that founded the serious games field. I think there were some earlier small games, but this is the one that basically said, this is something to do. And uh, Jerry asked me to talk a little bit about the challenges of building a game inside of a government entity. And, uh, you know, we were the pioneering serious games, so what pioneers get the arrows. And I, I, I'll just put this on there just uh, for some of the notes, uh, for those of you who are trying to do something innovative inside of a a very rigid and archaic and out-of-date organization. Um, we had a pervasive culture of pomp and ignorance inside of the school. Uh, basically a lack of comprehension of why I was building a game R&D effort inside of the school and a lack of wanting to know why, which I always thought was very interesting. It was sort of like the anti-innovation was the theme of where I was working. Cultural, we imported a full game development team uh, into a, this organization and, uh, you know, the kids are between 22 and 29. My dean was 79, and uh, there was a mismatch, should we say. Um, bureaucracy issues. Everything we purchased for this project had never been purchased by a government entity ever, ever before. We had to purchase games to study. We had to purchase game engine licenses. Um, which, you know, you go and order a game engine license and the legal office says, well, that'll take us 12 months to process the paperwork. I thought that was extremely interesting. Um, we had to go buy BDUs for the development team. Business cards, those of you who work for the government, you can't even have a business card. Um, purchasing everything was this incredibly huge and very interesting challenge. I'm going to write a book and make a bestseller. Those of you who work for NASA or the government, you understand what I'm talking about. And we had the additional problem is that the Goldwater's Nickel, Nichols bill was not understood by the two-star admiral at the top of the school. And that says joint military operations are the future. He only believed things for the Navy should be done. So I'm building a game for the Army. Okay. 
enough complaining. And then, you know, I'm happy doing what I'm doing. So what I decided to do was um, my birthday present for my 50th birthday was to quit and uh, ask for a temp position at USC. And what I did at USC is I told the Dean of Engineering, I said, why don't you hire me and I'll build a game research and education program there and we're going to be real successful. And so uh, here's what we're doing. Um, we formed a thing called the Game Pipe Laboratory. And the mission of the Game Pipe Laboratory is research, development, and education on technologies and design for the future of interactive games. Here's the thought. The thought is that the game industry in, by the end of 2007 will be the size of the US Navy. It needs an R&D capability. The game industry does no R&D. So we're thinking we ought to be the place. We also have a lot of smart students, so they can sit and think about developing those future supporting technologies and genres of games that the game industry is never going to think about. And we can prototype them and build them inside of the school. So that's kind of the, the nugget of the mission. Um, you start out building a research organization on games. You have to say, what is the research agenda? The research agenda is infrastructure, cognition in games, immersion, serious games, and game design. Infrastructure are all of the you know, hardware and software issues, such as how do we make dynamically extensible, semantically interoperable games of the future, games that can update from the security standpoint without anyone actually having to go download a new executable, it gets downloaded automatically. How do we add in new characters automatically into the game without, again, downloading a new executable? There's very interesting research in that area. Mobile gaming is becoming a real interesting and totally hot topic. If I ask my students what game platform do you want to program, they actually all say the Sony PlayStation Portable. They all want to have something they can carry with them. And the only problem they have is that I'd rather not carry two things. I'd like to have a phone and the PlayStation Portable jammed into the same cartridge, and there's some other changes as well. Cognition in games is, is sort of, you, you want to take game AI one further. You know, one of the problems that we've had is most games to date have had physical interfaces. So they rely on joysticks and push buttons and keys, and we do physical things in the game. If we're going to try and get to emotion, uh, emotionally uh, directed games in the future, then we have to learn how to model human emotional behavior. And we have to be able to display emotion back in the characters and actually, in fact, sense human emotion, which I'll talk a little bit more under the immersion bullet. Human em What's happening that's really interesting, there are no fewer than three companies. In fact, one of them is M-Sense of Monterey, California. What a surprising coincidence. Um, that makes a sensor that reads human emotional state and provides it as input to the video game. So what can you do with this? Well, you can now have games that have characters that react back to you if you do the R&D to change the facial uh, emotions. And if you can maybe get into the point where you can also add in some of the uh, speech rec advanced speech recognition that would really make games super for the future. Serious games. This is becoming huge. Of course, we can always go say, let's go hire a contractor and build a game, but there's some research here. We have to know if we have a particular set of learning objectives, how do we start out and get there and make sure that we actually get those in the game? And game design, which is how do you develop theories for building both entertainment and serious games? Let's move on. Push the button. Okay, serious games, I just kind of drew this bubble chart and I haven't updated in about a month or two. So it kind of tells you what I think of in the serious game space. Of course, we have strategic communication where America's Army comes from. We have training and simulation in all of its affiliated Department of Defense and NASA senses. We have game-based learning because everyone and their brother comes to me and says, well, in the future, we're going to replace all teachers at the K through 12 level with games and kids will learn from games. Isn't that right? And I, you know, in a way, it's very seductive. I think you're going to get very far down the road towards that. And the real question is we have to make sure that the kids really are learning. You know, there's some studies out there right now that say a really excellent game at the educational standpoint is 50% as good as an outstanding teacher. I think that's a great number myself because I don't think our schools are filled with outstanding teachers. Public policy. There's people who want to build games for public diplomacy. Everyone who listened to NPR yesterday heard about the uh, Darfur is Dying game uh, out of USC. Got great attention. Um, 
dime modeling, diplomatic intelligence, military, and economic modeling is actually of interest to the Department of Defense because we, if you go look at the 50-year uh, history of operations research field, they studied red force against blue force, folded gap. Now we actually have to think about what are the economic effects here, what are the military effects, what are the intelligence effects and the diplomatic effects that we have to consider if we actually go and do an operation. We need to, th people want to do this in game form. So let me show you a couple of things that we built. I've only, uh, we only basically stood this lab up uh, in uh, August of 2005. We built a game uh, joint with the Federation of American Scientists and Brown University on immunology education for high school kids. These are just screenshots from the game. We're building a game for the Scripps Institute of Oceanography called Fish Quest. It's with the Digital Fish Library. They have all of these great, cool uh, MRI scans of fish and uh, we're building this very fun game for them right now. Uh, we're building a game for the uh, Department of Homeland Security. Uh, USC has a, a CREATE Center, which is a Homeland Security Center. And we're building a fire scope incident commander, which basically sends the game development team, which I believe is almost all male. There's one woman in that group. They have to visit all of the fire stations in Los Angeles with cameras and video and audio recorders. So they're a very motivated team, not unlike the America's Army team. We're building a game on the Kokin Indians for the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, which is a historical reenactment game. And this is all with student labor. Oh, we're building uh, Montage, which is a Russian history expo game, also uh, inside of the lab. So let's uh, move ahead and tell you we start a brand new bachelor's and master's in computer science specializing in game development in the fall. Why are we doing this? Let me give you a little bit of background. This is the, the important chart. This is, a na this is a, I believe, a national trend, which is the number of people who are applying as undergraduates who want to do computer science has dropped horribly. 70% decrease in undergraduate applicants to computer science programs internationally, okay? There's an echo of this in engineering as well. So who's interested? Of course, the chair of computer science of USC, as soon as I landed in campus, he goes, you've got to help us build this degree program. We went from 800 undergraduates to 300, help. The USC dean of engineering uh, came to me and said, you can do this, and this would be very helpful, but it has to be a strong degree. So it looks like a double major, by the way. Microsoft. Microsoft has given us money to fund a study. Does having a bachelor's in computer science specializing in game development help recruit people and retain them? All chairs of computer science are very interested because my email is filling up with people who want me to fly to, I think, 15 different places all throughout the country and tell them what we're doing. And, and I, I could live on the airplane if, it, if I didn't worry about it work, messing up my workout schedule, all right? DARPA. Um, I was talking to the associate director uh, of DARPA this morning at breakfast time, and uh, this is an international trend. DARPA has a study panel on their own, and they're very interested. So this is a big deal. Okay. Everyone is worried. Um, Put this slide up there. Game industry is going to double in size in the next uh, 24 months. 65% of their hiring requirement is for people who have the programming skills and understanding of how to build games. 5% is for people who know how to design games. 30% is for people who know how to build art. So I'm working with the dean of the fine arts school to stand up a bachelor's in fine arts specializing in game design. It's going to get them the artists that they need. So let's talk about games for space exploration. And I know I probably overrun my talk time by uh, many minutes here. Games have a tremendous potential for the re return to the moon and the mission to Mars. Why? Serious games and their underlying models and simulations will be foundations to these missions. Before we launch anything, we're going to rehearse it thousands of times in a game form. It's going to be a network game. It's going to have a real interesting interface to it. NASA needs to get very serious about getting into the game business. It has to look at the lessons of the Naval Postgraduate School and say, you know what? We're going to call it games. This is the right way to go, and we're going to go there because the people who are going to fly the mission to the moon and to the Mars will have grown up with video game culture. 
My suggestion, form a university-affiliated research center. USC Institute for Creative Technologies, which I wrote the document for in 1999, has been an incredible success. It's built some very interesting and innovative research for the Army. NASA needs to think about doing the same thing. It needs to build a shop that has its own internal capabilities to build games of NASA mission importance. This does not cut out contractors, but this serves as a hub that can really drive some of this work. We uh, can't conclude this talk without thinking about using the Presidential Commission's uh, report to try and give you an idea for a game. And of course, uh, this, this idea of the game is, is from a large number of people who are affiliated with NASA or in or around NASA or the Department of Defense. Probably Major uh, P Peter Garrison is, Garrison is the, my biggest influence on this. He's just an excellent, an excellent great guy. And we've thought about trying to build a game called Sim Moon Base. And I apologize, I, I, I swiped all of the artwork in this section off the internet, and if it's your artwork, thank you. And uh, I think they're really cool pictures. Okay. Um, you think about the target of landing on the moon is 2018, and you have to think about where are we going to get the pipeline of youth that are going to be interested in careers and engineering in space. We have a problem. The drop in computer science is just one piece of it. Engineering has the same problem. No one's going to be an engineer anymore. One way to reach America's youth is, of course, through the medium of the video game, a la America's Army. So the thought has been build a game called Sim Moon Base and uh, basically focus on the engineering challenges of returning to the moon and doing the mission to Mars. So we're going to start out by folk building this one that lets you build, in sufficient detail, a self-sustaining moon base. And in fact, it's going to be an MMOG. And the purpose of the proposed game is to teach people about space resources. Two minutes, he says. I, I'm going to flip through this very quickly. And, and put, put it out there so that you can have people compete across the world and learn a lot about the engineering, cap engineering requirements that you need to build moon bases of the future. And I think it would in really influence the kids. What does the Army know? And maybe I'll stop with this slide. The Army knows if kids between the ages of 11 to 14 play America's Army, then they will be twice as likely to consider a career in the Army when they turn 18 as kids who do not play America's Army. So think about that. If we do that for engineering in game form, then I think we have the potential to do this wonderful mission to the moon and the re mission to Mars and the return to the moon. So anyway, I will stop there and uh, take any questions, or we should just point on to the next speaker. Next speaker. I'm going to start without slides because we're running over already. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone noticed, but we've been going in order of amount of facial hair for our presentation. Uh, I'm Daniel Laughlin. I am head of the NASA Learning Technologies Project for the, on the technical side of it, uh, but I am here today because my work uh, doing research on educational uses of games for NASA. Uh, we two years ago got a phone call from Bill Davis right down there who said America's Army could do a NASA game, and at the time, no one in NASA was in a position to even say yes or no. There was a dearth of understanding of games in general and whether or not that was something we wanted to do. A week later, I was put on the job of figuring out what NASA wants to do with games, largely because I've got a PhD in education and technology, and I've been playing games since computers were brand new. So I was in the right place at the right time with the right background. Uh, Two months later, the Aldridge report came out and said NASA needs to find a way to use game technology to inspire and educate the next generation. Uh, and since then, NASA has had underlearning technologies, a game research uh, initiative. Next slide. Or do I have the controls? Ooh. I'm empowered now. 
Uh, these are the reasons NASA is looking at, at games, and they're not any different than what you will find out in the literature or what Mike and, and Jerry have already told us. People play games. The next generation of explorers uh, that are going to come out of NASA are people who play games. And these are some of the elements bridging the gaps between their existing knowledge, stealth learning. Uh, that's when you, you are learning without even realizing you're learning what you're supposed to do. Uh, soft failure. You can do it again and again and again, and it doesn't cost NASA millions of dollars to set up the simulator every time. Uh, bonus time is something that, that I'm trying to push. We've got a very limited amount of time in classrooms for students to study much of anything, but they are spending an enormous amount of time playing computer games outside the classroom. A fun exploration game, a real NASA-based game that can capture their interest will also capture hours and hours and hours outside the classroom dedicated to STEM or STEAM uh, educational topics. Uh, right now there are two of the mission directorates, of which we have four inside of NASA, that are currently very interested in games. That's the Exploration Systems Mission Directorate and the Space Operations Mission Directorate. And we don't have good time to go into what each one does, but they'll both be intimately involved in our return to the moon. And they're both interested in games as potential tools uh, because you will be able to lure, hopefully, many, many, many more students in to fill up the STEM careers, the STEM education paths that Michael already told us are not being filled up currently. Uh, NASA is very interested. They, there's no way NASA will compete against LucasArts or even Virtual Heroes when it is time to hire people who have the degrees NASA needs. We need to get a bigger pool of people with those degrees instead of trying to draw from a smaller pool and take slices away from everyone else. We need a larger community and that's NASA's objective. It's one of our one of NASA's three education outcomes now. One is to increase the number of students in the field, in the STEM fields, and one is to increase the overall workforce, and the other is to get the American public aware and, and buying into NASA's mission. It's ISDC, you've all heard that already, I'm sure. Jerry gave us this. This is the, the numbers of students or of people playing in the country and why this is important at the bottom. Every single student going into college today, going into college five years from now, going into college ten years from now is familiar with games and it is something they're comfortable with and this is a way to meet them in their comfort zone and give them the sort of information NASA and everybody working in NASA-like science, engineering and technology fields is interested in seeing more of. Uh, we want to have a virtual career experience. This is state-of-the-art games. I'm used to working inside NASA where virtually no one I talk to has seen a computer game since they used to be pixels uh, in black and white. Uh, so I have to show them this so that they can see what games look like today. Uh, this is from EverQuest 2. These, by the way, I just pulled uh, from games that happen to be on my computer or my wife's computer. So I was getting the latest state-of-the-art games. These are the sort of images NASA has. They are not out of keeping with what you just saw and, and what games can do. There's not a slide that comes after this that has a picture of what NASA thinks of as a game today because most of the games that are on NASA websites are at the level of hangman or concentration uh, and Frankly, I didn't want to come to ISDC and then have to explain to someone why I picked their, picture, their game to show as the not flattering comparison to the state-of-the-art games. Uh, so use your imagination. Uh, this is a commercial. Uh, I'm letting you read that. I'm barely addressing it. NASA just put out a solicitation for uh, request for entrepreneurial offerings uh, that closes in a month and a half uh, and everyone should be aware of it in case they have any interest and Debbie Rivera who is the woman in charge of this did me a favor Thursday so their slides there. Uh, NASA is considering putting together something in the order of a massive multiplayer online game or possibly other options, but is looking at creating what uh, Edward Castronova calls a synthetic world. Uh, what I am calling a cyber world, swapping out the CI with an SCI. Uh, 
where they can put together experiments and physics and astronomy and astrobiology and challenges to build bases on the moon and to get the sort of exploration that NASA is interested in and let students at all levels work in those environments in a collaborative way, work with people from around the world and build on those experiences and let NASA at the same time use it as a giant research lab to do experiments uh, where for the, what it costs to hire a few scientists, you can in fact get tens of thousands of students working on solving problems that it would take a, a century to get the same amount of brain power on if you were just doing it inside. Uh, so that's part of the spin-off of the game. But the real purpose is to meet students where they live with the things they're familiar with and comfortable with and give them a fun, entertaining, and at the same time educational experience so that they can come and take the places of the people that I read in the news recently are all getting older and older at NASA and not giving up their jobs yet. Uh, so. We have to fill up NASA, we have to fill up Virtual Heroes and LucasArts, and Frank, we've got to replace Michael one day, he'll retire. Uh, we need to grow that pool of people, and as the uh, National Academies of Sciences report last fall came out and said, we're getting a, becoming a smaller and smaller slice of a growing market, and we need to reverse that trend. And NASA Education is interested in trying to do that experimenting starting next year with a solicitation coming out to ask for proposals to design a NASA educational game. Uh, and that's the end of my commercial. Thank you for coming. Uh, unfortunately, we're out of time, but we will take your questions. Uh, Michael and Daniel and I will go outside uh, right after this and meet with you on an individual basis and hopefully answer any questions you have about our presentation. But thank you for coming. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Jerry.